Gloucester. A 39-year-old man calls 999. He's suffering extreme chest pain. Are you clammy or having cold sweat? I'm sweating now. <laughs> Paramedics are dispatched. I saw straight away that he was having a heart attack. We gave him some aspirin and GTN to dilate the heart. After treating the man at the scene, they transfer him to an ambulance and set off for the nearest cardiac unit. But on the way... His heart couldn't cope with it any longer. He goes into cardiac arrest. They stop, restart his heart and head off again. But minutes later... Exactly the same as before. We knew we were going to have to shock him. Once more, he's resuscitated. On blue lights and sirens, they restart their journey. Then it happens again. He effectively died three times at this point. Originally from West Wales, Ronnie moved to Gloucester with his parents when he was around nine years old. He now calls it home. Well, sort of. Yes, all right. Because <laughs> like, Welsh people are um, proud people, aren't they? So I always class Wales as my own. Roots and family are important to Ronnie. My mum and dad, they live across the way. And my brother lives across the way as well. And my sister lives in Neath. Um, I've got close, very close family. He's only 39, but Ronnie has suffered a number of health problems in recent years. I've got rheumatoid arthritis in my full body. I got a job to walk, so I don't, I don't walk very far. I never had brain surgery as well. Surgeons removed a growth from the back of his brain. It was closing the artery and it was causing a lot of pain and stuff like that. But I had a biopsy done and all that and it disappeared, thank the blessed Lord. Since then, Ronnie's carried on enjoying life with the support of his family. I got a good life, a very good life, a very normal life. But just generally, my health, I didn't think about it, to be honest with you. It's late afternoon on a bright spring day, and Ronnie's at home on his own. I was sat over by the TV, listening to my niece singing on YouTube. Then, out of nowhere, he experiences a sudden pain. It was like something was stuck in my throat, and it wouldn't go away. Ronnie takes some painkillers, but they don't help, and the severe discomfort increases. It was a crushing feeling of the, of the chest. It got that intense that I knew that I had to ring the ambulance. This is Ronnie's agonising 999 call. Ambulance service, patient breathing. I am patient. OK, tell me exactly what's happened. I've got a lot of pains in the chest and it's really hurt and it won't go away. What's the address there, sir? He manages to give his location, but his condition is rapidly deteriorating. It isn't going to delay any care for you at all, but I do need to ask you a few questions to make sure you get the right care. Oh. Um, what's the telephone number you're calling from? I know it's, I know it's painful. Oh, please. I can't talk to them, please. I couldn't breathe. I was whispering. When I was talking, I was whispering. The pain's just indescribable. Just only yes or no answer to the oh. questions, OK? Are you clammy or having cold sweat? I'm sweating now. <laughs> and have you ever had a heart attack or angina? No. Rest assured, help is being arranged for you, OK? That help comes in the form of rapid response paramedic Amy. Going to a 39-year-old with chest pain, I thought it was quite unlikely, but he could be having a heart attack. The quicker we got there, the better. As Amy races to reach him, Ronnie spots his neighbour in the street and struggles to the front door. The call picks up his plea for help. You help me, please. I don't have a pain in my chest. The man takes over the phone call. I'm, I'm his next door neighbour. He's struggling to speak in a bad way. Uh, I know. We are coming to you as quick as we can. Uh, Ronnie, they're on their way, aren't they? Ronnie's neighbour does his best to calm him. Be best, mate. Ronnie, be best. <sighs> It was just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Promise you, deep breaths. I know it does, mate. Take some deep breaths. How's Ronnie doing there? He's sweating profusely. He is sweating. Um, yeah, and very, like, pale in colour. Only six minutes after Ronnie called the emergency services, Amy arrives at his home. They're here now. Yeah, OK, you thank okay. you, help. Yeah, Take thank care. you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. While getting my stuff out, I could see Ronnie led on the sofa really unwell. So I said, we need to do an ECG to do a trace of his heart to see actually what's going on. The result leaves no doubt about the seriousness of Ronnie's condition. I saw straight away that he was having a heart attack. It was almost horrible feeling, because as soon as he said that I was having the heart attack, 
I knew that, I, you know what I mean, there's a chance that I might die. Amy calls for an urgent backup ambulance, then begins administering vital care. Ronnie begs his neighbour to call his family. I really, really wanted to, I wanted to be, I wanted my mum there, honestly. I really wanted my mum there with me, and I couldn't get my words out. The neighbour manages to contact Ronnie's sister just as the backup ambulance arrives with paramedic Becky on board. Amy was carrying out some observations and I was getting the, the drugs ready. Just getting him into a position that he was as stable as he could be, ready for any movement. We gave him some aspirin and GTN to dilate the heart. As Ronnie is loaded into the ambulance, his sister arrives at the house. Just my sister being there made me feel better. But he needs urgent surgery and the nearest cardiac unit is in Bristol, 40 miles away. We knew that Ronnie was so unstable we just didn't know what would happen. So we made sure that we were prepared for all eventualities before we left to go to hospital. But within minutes of leaving, Ronnie's heart stops pumping. His heart basically couldn't cope with it any longer. He goes effectively unresponsive and goes into cardiac arrest. They stop the ambulance. The defibrillator pads were already on, so we were able to do chest compressions and then shock him pretty much within 30 seconds. His heart then very quickly went back into a normal rhythm. As he went into cardiac arrest, Ronnie slipped in and out of consciousness. I remember dying. I remember, I remember seeing things. I remember coming back out of it. I can remember my sister crying and all that. But I come back straight into pain. And when I was out, I wasn't in pain. But at least the pain signals he's alive. The ambulance sets off again on blue lights and sirens, but they don't get far. Exactly the same as before. We knew we were going to have to shock him. Once more, they stop and attempt to restart Ronnie's heart. Same response. He, he came back around, but quite, quite quiet. They head off again. But it's soon clear Ronnie won't survive the journey. He then goes into a third cardiac arrest. They bring Ronnie back yet again. His heart's gone through a, a, a massive ordeal, um, and he's obviously effectively died three times at this point. There was no chance of us getting to Bristol. We decided to divert back to Gloucester Hospital, where consultants could stabilise him. Ronnie's sister has alerted their parents, who are waiting for them at the hospital. I grabbed their hands, and they grabbed my hand, and I told them I loved them, and they, loved, they said they loved me. The doctor already told them that they didn't know if I was going to live or die. It wasn't looking good for me anyway. Medics at Gloucester managed to stabilise Ronnie so he can be transferred to the specialist unit in Bristol. A consultant travels with him in the ambulance. We took him in on the stretcher and um, we gave a handover to the consultants ready to unblock his heart. At Bristol, Ronnie gets the life-saving surgery he needs. They put a stent in that side and uh, it op reopened my artery and it was like a release of new life and um, this side then they done two days later. He's overjoyed with the results. I was the most gratefulest, happiest person in the whole wide world. You could have couldn't give me the lottery and I wouldn't have been more happy than having that done. I was perfect. Later Ronnie gets the chance to thank the ambulance team. It was just amazing like Neither myself nor Becky, we've, ever, we've never met anybody that has been so critically unwell before um, and had that chance to sort of meet them later. It's great uh, job satisfaction. I mean, not every day can you say that you've saved someone's life. So essentially that's, that's what happened and it was great to see him. It was a very emotional day, but it was a, a good day. It was something I had to do to say thank you because they saved my life and I'm so happy. There's a man who beat the odds. You don't come much closer to leaving this world than that. And what an heroic effort by the paramedics who just would not give up. Amazing. Now back to North Wales and a young hiker who needs the help of another emergency service, this time the volunteers of Mountain Rescue. Would-be army recruit Charlotte has slipped on ice near the summit of Snowdon while climbing with her friend Mandy. Conditions are bad and getting worse. 
Experienced hiker Dave heading down with another group has an emergency pack. Wrapped her in a thermal blanket and a thermal bag to try and warm her up. A nurse walking with him suspects Charlotte's leg is broken. Mountain rescue is on the way, but with high winds and blizzard conditions looming, Dave's advised Mandy and everyone else to head back down the mountain, leaving him and one other woman to stay with Charlotte. Alan is on the first of three mountain rescue teams scrambled and knows there's no time to lose. Because of the injury, the casualty was unlikely to be moving. Lying in the snow and hypothermia could come on pretty quickly. Just below the summit, with a violent storm blowing, Charlotte and her two companions can only wait. As time was going on, I didn't think they were going to find us. I was quite nervous, but I was trying to stay positive. Generally, we tried to keep one of the spirits up, but the wind was howling all around us and visibility was very poor. We were taking loads of selfies. You hope you're never going to be in that situation ever again. So if you're not going to take a selfie, then just when are you going to take a selfie? A Coast Guard helicopter is called in to carry the first four-man team up the mountain. But low cloud means they have to be dropped off halfway up at one of the closed mountain railway stations. It's on the other side of the mountain from Charlotte, and the wind speed makes landing difficult. As soon as we got off with things like the stretcher, which is quite a big sail, um, you were getting the full force of the wind. The helicopter flies off to fetch the second team. Alan and his colleagues leave some of their equipment for them to bring up. With their load lightened, they battle against the wind for 90 minutes, following the railway track to the summit. Then they drop down the other side of the peak. Everything was encased in ice. Snow was probably about 12 inches deep. By the time we got to Charlotte, the light had faded. It was now dark. I was so relieved that they were there. The team assess her injuries. It was felt that it probably wasn't a break, but a very serious sprain. Either way, they need to get her off the mountain, fast. The path below them is steep and icy, making it difficult to carry a stretcher. So the far more straightforward option, albeit longer in time, was to take her back up to the summit and then go down the railway line. But to do that, they need to wait for more rescuers to arrive with a stretcher. If they're all going to make it safely off the mountain, they need to get out of the icy wind. They erect a group shelter. We got in there as well to rewarm ourselves because we knew this was only the start of the rescue. And they put a splint on my leg just to keep it from getting bashed anymore. The wind had increased significantly at this point, probably gusting 100 miles an hour. The noise is incredible. Some of people's bags have been blown off and disappeared down the mountain. Four hours after the initial call for help, the second mountain rescue team arrive and load Charlotte onto a stretcher. Dave and his companion decide they can make their own way down. Before they go, they say goodbye to Charlotte. We all gave her a hug, and she was very grateful and very happy. And we proceeded with our walk, and two hours later, we got back to the car. Alan and the rescue team climb up and over to the other side of the mountain, then begin their slow descent with Charlotte. One of them films the conditions. Gusts of up to 100 miles an hour lift team members clean off their feet, dropping them up to 10 metres away. I've never experienced conditions like that up Snowdon before. There was no warning, there was no opportunity to brace yourself. You literally just found yourself flying through the air. There was a definite risk of injury to everybody concerned. It saps your energy because you're, you're constantly fighting the wind. Someone got blown onto me, so I knew it was quite bad, but they kept like comforted me and said I was all right. It takes 90 gruelling minutes to reach the railway station halfway point, where they're met by a third mountain rescue crew and an RAF team who take over the stretcher. We had a team of eight who'd carried the stretcher up and then down again for probably about the last hour, hour and a half. So the energy reserves were pretty low. More than an hour later, they reach a farm where they're met by team members in off-road vehicles who take them back to base. 
It's midnight when they arrive. Mandy is there anxiously waiting for her friend. Really shocking to see her like that in all wrapped up. I think that's when it really did hit me. I felt quite emotional and relieved and happy. I'm very thankful for everyone helping me. Alan and the rescue teams are also glad to be off the mountain. It was a very hard carry and we were certainly glad of the pizza and uh, tea that we got when we returned. Charlotte is checked over by paramedics before being taken by ambulance to hospital in Bangor, where they find she has badly pulled muscles in both her upper and lower leg. She's discharged with crutches and painkillers, and two weeks later has made a full recovery. Everyone appreciates what a close call it was that day. If Charlotte hadn't been uh, rescued in the way she had, she would have certainly been in a lot of trouble. I'm, I'm really, really grateful that the people were walking past. I think that if we hadn't have found her, she would have died. And people shouldn't underestimate the mountains. I'm just so thankful for everyone that helped me that day, especially because the mountain rescue, they were volunteers. So I'm going to do some fundraising for them. Tough work in tough conditions. And well done to Charlotte for fundraising as a thank you. See you next time for more Close Calls.